It's my pleasure to welcome you back to the forum. We had a little hiatus for a month and a half or so. And um, I'm Lisa Fahey. I'm the graphic designer and art curator at, in the marketing department at Park. And we're honored to have two speakers here today. Um, and the title is Single Cause, Two Perspectives. Michelle Raffin, she was a high-tech executive, a venture capital consultant, and a writer before deciding to devote her time to saving animals. As a founder of Pandemonium Aviaries in Los Altos, her passion for conservation and protection of the natural world is focused on saving bird species from extinction. She studied incubation with, with uh, Susan Kaiseki, who runs a California condor breeding project. Michelle is a certified aviculturist through the American Federation of Aviculture. Well, welcome, Michelle. Bird sanctuaries normally have very idyllic and sweet sounding names. So when people hear our name, Pandemonium, they always say, where'd you get that name? And actually we have two explanations. We have our official one, and then we have the real one. So the official explanation is the Pandemonium is the flock name for parrots. It's the Pandemonium of parrots. But in fact, we got that name before we had parrots and before we knew it was the flock name for parrots. <laughs> You see, I had actually chosen an idyllic name, Pasi Amod, to be our sanctuary name. That means peace and love in Spanish. But when my family heard it, they laughed hysterically. Because when you live in a family that has four kids, two goats, donkeys, dogs, cats, and hundreds of birds, there's a lot of Amod, but there's not any Pas. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about Pandemonium, who we are. I'm going to talk a little bit about our history and our programs. Then I'm going to show you a short video of one of the species that we're trying to save from extinction. And finally, I'm going to answer the question, at least in part, why is it important to save birds? So our mission is to, to prevent the extinction of targeted avian species through conservation and education. I'm going to talk a little bit more about conservation in a minute. But for now, I'd like to talk to you about our model, which is based on the world's first conservationist, Noah. Noah and the Ark. Now, according to the biblical story, Noah is a very ordinary guy. He doesn't have any special animal saving skills. In fact, it doesn't even say that he likes animals. But he's a good person. So when he's told that there's going to be huge climate change, he does what he can to save the world's animals. He builds a boat called the Ark. Now, the Ark is very much like other boats of its day. It's got the same materials. It's got the same dimensions. It has the same look. What differentiates it is its function. You see, the function of a normal boat is to take you from one place in the world safely to someplace new. The function of an ark is to keep you safe while the world around you becomes new. And no one knows that the world is safe when he sends off the pigeon. You know, most people say it's a dove, but they're the same bird. And when it doesn't come back, he knows that the land is safe for both humans and animals. So at Pandemonium, what we are doing is saving five species of birds just by keeping them safe. They come from New Guinea and from the Philippines. And when the world's there is safe for them, we'll turn them over to another organization for species reintroduction. Now, in response to um, education, our programs have changed over the years. We used to bring people to the sanctuary in order to introduce them to birds. Here I am showing a group of school children from East Palo Alto the wonders of a talking parrot. But it turns out that bringing people to the sanctuary doesn't work for our breeding birds, so we've changed how we do education. And right now, we do it by the written word. We disseminate information. Here are just some of the articles and the blogs that have come out of our organization in the last couple of years. Now, our birds originally came through rescue. This is Beekman. She had been in a small cage for 17 years. She hadn't seen the sun, hadn't been touched. Her toenails curled because she, they hadn't been cut. When we took her out, she immediately climbed a tree and took a sun bath. So while our birds came through rescue, we are not a rescue, we're a sanctuary. And the difference is that a rescue has an adoption arm. Animals come in and then they go out. At a sanctuary, we promise the animals that they'll stay with us for the rest of their lives. Now the birds of Pandemonium raise in, um, range in size from three-inch Lady Goulian finches to these tall, whoops, sorry, well, to these East, their East African crown cranes. And we feed every single bird every day fresh fruit. It's usually organic because birds are susceptible to pesticides. But we feed a lot of other different specialized diets. The birds up there, lorikeet, rain, rainbow lorikeets, eat only fruit. 
We've got birds like Persa Persa's and Lady Ross Taracos that eat nectar and pollen. We have a lot of grain eaters. They eat grains from very small to very large. In addition, we feed eight different kinds of pelleted diets. Now, the species that we keep come from all over the world. These are birds from Africa. Up there, we have um, vulture and guinea fowl. There's Ferguson. We call him the manager of the aviary. And there's a Lady Ross Taraco. We also have birds from India. This is a male green-winged dove. This is a Nicobar pigeon. And that's Piper. She's an albino ringneck. We've got lots of birds from Australia. Here are the rainbow lorikeets again. This is a scarlet-chested male um, grass parakeet. This is a crimson-winged female. Here we have a pair of tricazines, and that's a male eastern rosella. We have birds from South America. That is a yellow-naped parrot named Shana. She sings opera. We have a bird named Tico who knows how to open just about any cage door. We have to use a padlock. And every time we, we spin the numbers, he looks very intently. <laughs> and there's a blue-necked tanager. We also have birds from Melanesia. This is a Victoria crown pigeon. This is a Luzon bleeding heart. And these are green nape pheasant pigeons. Now, sometimes people come to a fork in the road that changes their lives dramatically. I came to a hurt dove by the road in 1996. I thought the bird had been hit by a car because of its location. I took it to a vet, and I found out that it had been dropped by a hawk. Well, my experience with that bird led me to adopt a flock of six doves. And um, that led me on this journey through the world of zoos and breeders and conservation organizations and humane societies um, and rescues. So my family already had chickens. So by the end of 1996, we had 18 birds, two species, and two aviaries. I didn't know how to take care of the doves, so I went in search of information. And I met a breeder in Sebastopol. And he and his wife sort of took me under their wing. And they started giving me birds. And their friends gave me birds. And their friends gave me birds. Other friends gave me birds. Humane societies started giving me birds, rescue groups, sometimes individuals. And so by the end of 2005, I had more than 200 birds. These were split into 50 species and many aviaries, including the last aviary. So this is a picture of the last aviary. And the way it got its name was every time I would build an aviary, I would say to my husband, this is the last aviary. And I would put up a sign, a permanent sign saying it. And then I'd have to go back and change the sign. <laughs> he finally suggested that I make it a movable sign, which I did. But it got pretty confusing, because we had a lot of last aviaries. So we retired at aviary number nine. And now we number all of our aviaries. Here are some pictures of some of the aviaries at Pandemonium. Well, in 2005, we decided to shut down rescue, taking in no more individual birds. And we decided to focus on species. As you can see, we had a lot more birds by 2012. And those all came through acquisition or through conservation breeding. Now, the reason that we shut down rescue can best be seen if we go back in history a little bit. In 1992, the United States passed a very important law. It was called the Wild Bird Act. And prior to this, we were taking 350,000 birds every year out of the wild. For every bird that was captured and made it here alive, there was at least two that died in capture, transit, or quarantine. So the United States was taking a million birds a year out of the wild in order to be our pets. Now, after the law was passed, this changed, and there were fewer than 3,000 birds. But it had an unforeseen negative consequence on the bird breeding industry in the United States. You see, because bird breeders could no longer bring in a variety of birds from the wild, they changed the way they did business. And they started breeding either birds at the high end of the market, like the expensive ma you know, macaws or cockatoos, or at the low end, the mass-produced budgies and finches. And they got rid of everything in between. So unbeknownst to me, and probably to them, pandemonium ended up with some very important genetic material. Oops. This is a green nate pheasant pigeon male. And in 2005, his, his mate died. And what happened to this bird is he started to cry. And he cried and cried. He cried for days. Days turned into weeks. And I finally decided that I had to buy a mate for him. So I went in search. What I found out was that in all of the zoos in the United States, there were only 32 green nate pheasant pigeons left. That in the 10 years since I'd been doing rescue, the world of birds had changed. 
and once common birds were now endangered in the wild or going extinct in aviculture, and that without my realizing it, my backyard had become an ark. So what I did is I did an inventory of all the species that we had, and I found 14 that had become extremely rare. And I decided to return most of them to breeders who could then breed them. I don't have photos of most of these birds, but I have a few. Whoops. This is a blue ground dove. Um, this was the last wild-caught African half-collar male in the United States. This is a Key West quail dove. And we had several um, pairs of golden hearts. I don't think there are any left. But there are some birds I've gotten really close to, and I didn't want to give them away. Um, in some cases, they had been in the house because they were sick, and I would gotten to know them personally. And so I decided to become a conservation breeder at that point. And that's really what pandemonium does, as its main mission is we're breeding these five species. These are the target species, Victoria crown pigeons, blue crown pigeons, Nick Kabar pigeons, green eight pheasant pigeons, and bleeding heart doves. Pandemonium now has the second largest flock of Victoria crown pigeons under conservation of any organization in the world. We also have the second largest flock of blue crown pigeons. The largest flock is at Jurong Park, which is the largest bird park in the world in Indonesia. In terms of green night pheasant pigeons, we have the largest flock in the world. In the last three years, a third of all of the captive births in the world have happened at our organization. And what's even more exciting is our birds are raised by their parents, not hand-raised. We only raise one hand-raised bird, and that's, whoops, I don't know if I can get back to it. That's Peck. She's named after a river in New Guinea. So now what I'd like to do is show you a short video about one of the species that we're saving in the Victoria crown. And let's see if this will work. Oh, good. Thank you. Yes. The first Victoria crown to come to pandemonium was a handicapped female named Wing. She had gotten her name because she had fallen off of a table and broken her wing. She's a fine bird, except that she can't fly. But she was lonely. So when I was offered her brother coffee, I jumped at the chance. The first winter they were here, they came down with colds. So I had to bring them inside in order to medicate them. I brought them into a laundry room, and the next morning when I went in, I found out that they had made themselves comfortable on top of the dryer and a pile of clean clothes. That's where they stayed for the four weeks that they had medication. And by the second day, I had absolutely fallen in love with these birds. I became aware about five years ago that these spectacular birds that are now the world's largest pigeon, that they were becoming very, very rare in their native New Guinea. And without help, they could disappear. When I found this out, I decided that pandemonium actually had to take action. We had to take action right away. Nobody knows exactly how many Victoria crown pigeons are left in the wild. Locals and birders no longer see them. They don't even hear them calling to each other in the forest. Since the time of the dodo, the world has lost more than 160 species of birds. One out of 10 bird species may soon disappear, including 900 species in the tropics alone. Most people don't realize that the dodo was the world's largest pigeon. Like the Victoria crown pigeon, the dodo lived only on one island. It was curious and had no fear of strangers. And these were strangers who built palm oil plantations. They also tore down the forest and they hunted the dodo to extinction. And this happened in just 80 years. Like the dodo, the crown pigeons are being hunted. Like the dodo, its forests are being torn down. Roads are being cut through, which makes it easier for hunters to gain access to the birds. And more and more people and machines are moving into what was once pristine areas. <coughs> Every year, 150,000 acres of rainforest are cleared for commercial development, logging, mining, agriculture. And this very precious habitat is destroyed. But what is really transforming the island is the building of palm oil plantations, which is exactly what did in the dodo. The birds are nominally protected by the Indonesian government, but in fact, no one is protecting them on site. 
conservation groups, for the most part, have pulled out of New Guinea because it's too dangerous to do work in the country itself. And that's why it's so important for organizations like Pandemonium to protect the birds that we took out of the wild. <laughs> At Pandemonium Aviaries, we view ourselves as sort of a modern day Noah's Ark. Our job is just to keep the birds safe. Originally, we started as a refuge for exotic birds whose owners and breeders could no longer care for them. Took in one bird, and one bird led to another, and right now we have more than 350 birds, 40 species. Panamonium is now a leading example of a new kind of conservation aviculture, and that's evident in our ARC program. ARC stands for Avian Recovery for Conservation. Our focus has shifted from rescue to conservation and breeding of endangered and rare species, specifically from the island of New Guinea. The birds that are under conservation are birds that were already in the United States. They were brought in prior to the Wild Bird Act when it was legal to bring in birds from the wild, or they are the offspring of birds that were brought in at that point. The Victoria crown pigeon is the first species to be put under conservation through ARC. Pandemonium now has the second largest population of Victoria crowns under conservation of any institution in the world. It turns out that some of our birds may very well be the breeding stock that we hope will replenish the populations that are plummeting right now in New Guinea. When it's safe for them to go back into the wild, we'll turn them over to another organization to do the species reintroduction. Everything is in place to save the Victoria crown pigeons. We have the breeders who want to join us. We have apprentices who want to learn how to breed them. We even have possible sites to house and keep the birds. And these sites are located in different parts of the country. But the window of opportunity to put these birds under conservation is at most five years because the breeders themselves and the flocks themselves are aging. While help of all kinds has been critical, we can't move forward with this plan without substantial funding. $5,000 protects the life of one Victoria crown pigeon who could be the parent of a bird who's returned to New Guinea. $50,000 puts a breeder's entire stock under conservation forever. And if we were to get an endowment of $3 million, we would be certain that we could save all of the flocks currently in the United States and have a really good shot of having these birds remain viable and at one day walking free in the forests of New Guinea. What better contribution to the world of birds and to ourselves to save a species? They're really beautiful birds, but there's nothing like seeing them in person. So we've brought one up. We have a tame bird named Fanny. She loves bananas, so we've been stuffing her with bananas all day. <laughs> she's quite satiated, I think, right now, but you'll have a chance to see her up in the reception area, and she's really quite magnificent. I would like to end um, telling you a story about our first parrot, because people often ask me, why should we save birds? And it's very hard for me to answer that succinctly because there are so very many reasons. But if there's one that I had to choose, it's because interspecies communication is really possible with parrots. I've lived with them now for many, many years, and I'm totally convinced that they do speak with meaning. But when we got our first bird, I wasn't so sure. And this is, let's see if we can get there. Oh, there we go. So this is Amigo. Amigo is our first parrot. I hadn't intended to get parrots because they're a lot of work. And I was at the vet's with my son and a hurt dove. And my son went off to the bathroom and he came back wearing this parrot on his shoulder. 
So I asked him how it got there, and he insisted that the parrot had picked the lock of his cage and climbed up his arm, and he had nothing to do with it. I didn't believe him, but since then, Amigo has done that three times with interns that he's liked. So I didn't want a parrot, but Nick wanted it, and the parrot had been at the vets for over a year, so she was very anxious to get rid of it. But she started giving us incentive after incentive to take the bird. Before I knew it, we had a parrot. Well, the first problem arose when we arrived home because we didn't have a cage. We hadn't planned to get a parrot. So Nick and Amigo just solved that very quickly. They decided that Amigo would live under Nick's bed. And that's where he lived. And he would talk all the time. He talked all day. Most of the things I couldn't understand, um, Nick would say he was telling him about his life before he came to live with Nick, or he was telling him about his day. Um, there were a few things that I did understand. Whenever Nick would walk into the room, Amigo would go, I love you. Whenever my husband would pass by, Amigo would yell out, asshole. <laughs> he never talked to me, but he would try to bite me. And if he ever connected, he would laugh hysterically. So there was one monologue that I did understand. And this went under the bed. We would hear this little voice saying, why? Why not? Why? Why not? This went on for a very long time. It was really cute for the first thousand times you heard it. It wasn't so cute anymore. And even Nick got tired of it. And one time, right after Nigo had said, why, Nick interjected, why not? And there was a slight pause. And from under the bed, we heard this voice say, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Michael Kern, our photographer, is next. Um, he is a renowned nature photographer. His vivid images, which you'll see after, um, captured readers of many prominent, uh, that's right, captivated readers of many prominent nature magazines, calendars, and journals. His images have been utilized by leading museums around the globe, including the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History and the British Museum of Natural History. Michael supports various conservation efforts throughout the Bay Area, including his current work with Pandemonian Aviaries. He is embarking on two new conservation photography projects, one with the USGS and also the Palo Alto Junior Museum and Zoo. Oh, Michael. and everyone for coming tonight to spend some time with us and listen to our stories. Um, I think the single cause that we've had with this poster is obviously conservation. In my perspective, you know, is that a picture is worth a thousand words. And as a conservation photographer, what I'm trying to do is grab the attention of the viewer. I'm trying to elicit some curiosity about the animal. I'm trying to maybe motivate them to learn more about the species and to hopefully take action either to um, work with the organization that's sponsoring it or to um, donate in some way. So that's a tall order for a photographer. And I thought the best way to explain what I do is to just continue the story that Michelle started with Pandemonium and talk about my experience there as a photographer and what I came across. And it, it's an amazing place. I think you've already got the impressions that there's you know, a lots of um, amazing birds, incredible facilities. But what really blows my mind is the integration of gardens and aviaries and birds and art into this seamless environment. It's, it's magical when you go there. And it, uh, it really, if there's an opportunity for you to visit sometime as part of an event, I, I highly recommend it. And you know, the, the, the thing, obviously, that's special there are the birds. And as a photographer, you know, going into an aviary to shoot, it's, it's a real challenge. And I think you saw the pictures that Michelle took. You know, there's lots of screens. There's lots of man-made structures. There's perches that are unnatural. And so even though you have this vision of being able to capture an image like this, or maybe like this, that really would get someone's attention, the reality is there's all these man-made structures, unnatural perches. Um, and so that's the problem that I faced when I walked into Pandemonium. And that's you know, the problem I want you to start thinking about. How would you solve that? Um, and so like any tough problem, I think you just initially begin working with the low-hanging fruits. And there are a number of animals that Michelle has that are acclimated to humans. In fact, they thrive on human interaction. And just by setting up a mobile studio with a backdrop and some studio lights, we were able to capture some amazing animals. These are portraits uh, of some, some incredible birds. And we were happy. We even were able to work with some of the, the endangered birds that were acclimated to work with us. But we had this vision. We wanted more. We wanted these birds in full flight and high resolution just to really 
sort of capture the magic. And so we, we had to go through a series of iterations to try to figure out how to do that. You know, we went into ninja mode, you know, but, you know, behavior modifications of the birds. And there's this trade-off of, you know, you don't want to handle the birds too much, um, but at the same, and you want to keep shooting them in their environment. But at the same time, you want to be able to capture the image. You want to be able to, um, to, to get the shot that you want. And so we went through sort of rearranging the aviaries to try to get um, a, a certain flight path between the perch and the, and the food dish and a nice backdrop. But it was too slow. We were getting shots, but it wasn't happening. Um, to the, we weren't getting exactly what we wanted. So we continued to uh, iterate through this, and, and I'm beginning to, to understand a little bit more about the behavior of these birds and what it takes to get a good shot. And when, I have, when I'm in this mode of trying to problem size, I, I just go to um, Home Depot, right? And I just walk the halls and, I, and the aisles, and I, and I begin to see I could use this, I could use this. And what ultimately happened is we ended up building our own sort of aviary studio. And it worked quite well. I mean, although we had to bring the birds into this environment to shoot with them, um, there was a place for them to go in the back where there was a dark corner where they would be able to, to be comfortable. And it worked. We were getting striking images. And the yield was one of the highest yields in terms of impressionable images that I've got out of any sort of man-made environment. And we, we tweaked it. We, 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 we set a perch in it. We raised it up for the birds that really were flying. And we, we set a perch in there. And we fixed one end. And we attached a string to the other to jiggle it. And we got the birds to start flying in this environment. And we got, I, I think, exactly what we were looking for, just shot after shot, bird after bird. And, and we were on a roll for months. We were just, you know, any bird we bring in, we were able to, to really capture them. And then we started bringing small flocks of birds in, and we were getting their behaviors intermingling with each other. And, and as, as Michelle told through her stories, these birds do have personality. And you really, when you spend time with them, you begin to see that and appreciate that. And I didn't know that before I started working with birds like this. And then their feathers. And, you know, when you're working with these birds and you're um, seeing them in different light and you're seeing the colors change and the iridescence when the light hits them in a certain way, you begin to, to realize that feathers are these magical things. And, and they're all over the place, on the ground, of course, because the birds are shedding them all the time through bolt. And I'd start picking them up, and I'd start playing with them in the light, and I began to realize, these are jewels. I mean, these are like little flowers, and they're absolutely gorgeous. And so I took them home, and I started working with them in a studio environment with lights on all different sides. And each feather has its own sweet spot, a balance between front lighting, back lighting, um, from the side, and, and it's, it, it's really, you know, it was soothing to me. At night, I'd go into the garage, and I'd start working with these things, and you, you search for the sweet spot, and then you work with them. And they're, you know, I mean, I just, you know, I get obsessed about things. I don't know if you could tell this. And my friends probably get tired of it because I grab, you got to work with feathers, you know. It's, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But, um, but, I, but I did, I, I still work with them, and I love them. And, uh, and we, Michelle always jokes, that's how I get paid, is in feathers at Pandavonium. <laughs> Um, let me take a step back. I, I did want to talk about pandemonium while I was fresh in your mind, but I want to, uh, there are lots of other aspects of the exhibit that you, you see tonight, and I wanted to sort of ground you in, in sort of my view of philosophy and then introduce you to these different uh, components. But to me, photography is a, is a balance between art and craft. Uh, art, the ability to vision something, uh, to be able to compose it, to be able to um, to put a message behind the image. And then the craft, obviously, the, the, the ability to execute and to be able to, um, to capture your vision. And, and you can really tell with pandemonium, the, the craft can be quite complicated at times. But it's a balance of these two things. And I always start the conversation about photography with this uh, concept. But this last year, I've had the opportunity to talk to a, a number of different groups about photography in my work. And, uh, and I, I refined sort of my review of how Photography works in my world. And there are a lot of photographers. My father is one, a very good photographer. Um, and he can just walk around the block and find a thousand things to take pictures of and be excited by that. But that's not how photography works for me. It starts with a passion and, you know, and, you know, spending time with the subjects that I want to be able to capture. And from there, I begin to see the visions. What is it that's beautiful about these animals that I want to be able to show the world? And the vision then drives the craft. You know, it's not the first time that you can capture exactly what you want, but through iteration, you're able to get it. And once the vision and craft come together, you're creating something that's really special. You know, I would consider art. 
And in, in my perspective, I'm working with lots of conservation organizations. I look at my art as a gift back to, or an homage back to my passions or to the organization so they can use them to communicate and to uh, motivate the population to act on their behalf. So this is the, and it's a repetitive cycle. I mean, I, I go through, I started with reptiles, I'm with birds, I'm working with bees now. Um, it just continues, and it's the same way. I spend time with them, I work with the biologists, I understand their behaviors, and then I begin to see what it is that's special about these animals. <clears throat> in my work, if I, if I just want to sort of categorize my work, it, it's hard to put me in any kind of genre. Uh, obviously, my subject is nature, but I'm not really a nature photographer because I do a lot of studio-type work, almost treat it like a fashion shoot. Um, but obviously, it's not a fashion shoot because I'm working with animals. And I'm trying to create, you know, sort of art with these images. And, you know, and this is fine. You know, I, can't, I don't get accepted by the nature people, really. I'm not really accepted by the, the fine art community. But niches are good, right? Because you, you, you have a unique style, and um, you're, you're, you can be differentiated in the marketplace. And that's, I'm very fine with sort of being in between each of these spaces. I, I want to introduce you to um, another major part of the exhibit um, that you'll see during the uh, reception. And it's the work that I've been doing with reptiles and amphibians. And the way I want to talk about uh, reptiles and amphibians is I want to share some of my thoughts about um, technique and what I try to do to be able to create these intimate portraits of the animals. And, and the first thing that's almost 99% critical is um, connecting with the eye, right? Um, everyone talks about eye contact or the eye is the window to the soul. And it's true. I mean, if you want the person to establish a relationship with this animal, you got to give them eye contact to begin that relationship. And so almost always, if you get the eye, and by the way, the eyes of these birds and the reptiles and amphibians are absolutely spectacular. Uh, and so it doesn't hurt that, they, that they're really interesting. But um, there are a couple of exceptions to this, and I, I'm rationalizing through them now. Uh, birds in flight, I think from behind, are absolutely stunning, almost angelic. And, and so the eyes are not important because you've got this, this beautiful figurine to, to work with. And I do a lot of work with uh, tarantulas and invertebrates, and I'm not sure how to work this two to eight ratio. Um, and so I, I, just, I think eyes are not as important with the spiders. Um, you gotta get low. You gotta get to be a peer with this animal. You need to enter their world. You need to, uh, once again, be able to establish a relationship with them. And you can always, um, if there's a group of photographers and we're doing a walk and you come across an animal in nature, you could tell the, the real serious photographers because they think it's almost like a war zone. They just throw themselves on the ground to get low, to get equal with the animals. Um, and, and I always travel with knee pads in my car because it's absolutely critical. There, there's a lot of psychology um, of uh, angle of shoot, right? If you're looking down on a subject, you have a superiority kind of impression. If you're looking up, you've got, you know, superior, you know it's an inverse relationship. So peer-to-peer -peer is critical um, in establishing a relationship. Um, almost to a fault, I work with simplistic backgrounds. Um, what I see, the beauty of these animals, are, are the intricate details of the animal itself. It's the, it's the color, it's the pattern, it's the texture, it's the line. Um, and, and here's a, you know, the same animal, shot 10 minutes apart. This is in um, Uganda. We discover the animal. We're all in a photo frenzy. We want to just make sure we get the animal. We're not thinking. Um, and it's, it's a snapshot. It's a snapshot. And usually you do that right away before the animal scourges away. I don't know if you've ever seen a chameleon run. I mean, it's not really going to run away from us. Um, but you think now. So get it in the light. Um, adjust your depth of field. Soften the background. And it's, it's a world of difference. You've, you've taken a, a snapshot and created you know, a, a piece of, you know, a photograph, a nice photograph. And then you'll notice that when you approach these images tonight the, the, on the wall, um, they're really close and personal. I mean, you, you, I really feel the frame. I spent a lot of time before I finish an image really thinking about what are the critical components of that image that I want to portray or I want you to look at as a, as a viewer. And this is a leaf-tailed gecko. You would think a leaf-tailed gecko, you want to show the, the leaf tail because that's what's important about it. But not in this case. What's important here is the, this clown-like face, the fact that this lizard can lick its eyes. Um, and so you, you, you have to, you know, you spend some time and you, you re really critically uh, decide what needs to be in the photograph and what doesn't. And, and you'll see this over and over in terms of my work. You know, just eye to eye, 
at their level, simplistic backgrounds, if any background at all. So I think some of you guys probably know this snake. This is a San Francisco garter snake. It's federally endangered. It lives right in our backyard. The, the regions as far north as sort of Pacifica and Sharp Park and as far south as, as uh, Ana Nuevo. Um, and when I was a kid, I vividly remember, uh, because I was into reptiles, as you can tell. I'm sort of reliving that now as an adult. But as a kid, I'd be looking through these books of snakes, and I'd always come back to the snake. This is the most beautiful snake in the world, absolutely the most beautiful snake in the world. Well, for the last 10 years, I've been traveling the world shooting snakes. And I'll say, it's the most beautiful snake in North America. But the whole family of Atheris, um, which is the African bush vipers, are, you know, in my eyes, the most beautiful in the world. And there are a number of these in the exhibit um, that you'll see on the walls. A, a close second, or third, I would say, is uh, this is a picture of a green tree python. Now, the problem with this animal, first of all, it's, it's a beautiful animal. I, to me, it's beautiful. Uh, it's absolutely striking. It's, um, but this has been, uh, it's, it's a color morph that's been developed in captivity. They're not, they don't look like this. This is, um, this is an extreme example. And, um, but they're, and, and to me, it's beautiful. The red eyes, the, the black with the contrasting colors and, the, and the, the colors themselves. But to a lot of people, they, they can't see this beauty. All they see is a snake. And so this sort of, edged me into another body of work that I call abstract reality. And what I do is I abstract out the form of the snake and just leave the essence of the animal. And there's a whole sort of area of the exhibit that, that shows this work. And, and I just love, I mean, when I'm traveling and shooting or, or working as a shooter, I don't have access necessarily to the animals every day. I, I, I have access, uh, because it's a, with pandemonium, it's, it's a lot of work to run that you know, facility, right? And so when I come in, I take a handler, I need space. So I get you know, once a week or once every other week. And, and when I'm not shooting, I'm doing other stuff, working with feathers, uh, doing these abstractions. And I just love these patterns that evolve, these color palettes. And, uh, and you know, this, is a, this is actually my favorite bird at uh, pandemonium. This is the Nicobar pigeon. It's one of the... Um, the five managed birds under conservation. And um, they're absolutely striking. And they live in the shadows, the undergrowth, undergrowth. And when they're in the shadow, not in the light, they're dark as a crow. You, you, can't, you don't see any color at all. But when they feel safe and they think that they're alone, they come out into the sunlight. And it's the most spectacular, iridescent display of color in, in the whole facility. And let me tell you, pandemonium is full of color. But this is special. I want to talk a little bit about uh, expedition. And there's actually a couple of other areas I'm going to talk about because they're part of the exhibit. Um, expedition work, there's, there's nothing like it. You find yourselves in positions where you wonder, how the hell did I ever get into this position? Um, you're into environments where you just could never replicate in a studio world. Um, you're, you're working with animals. It took us seven hours to climb a mountain in, in Uganda to be able to find this species. They're just not available outside of their natural habitat. But, but to me, the thing about um, expedition work is the cultural whiplash that I find myself in. And I, I spent four weeks in Madagascar with an organization called Exoterra. And basically, we just traveled by boat. Um, this is our boat here. And, and we went to places where there are just no roads. Um, the only access is, is by boat. And these guys are all into discovering new species of animals. They're into geckos. So four weeks of looking in trees for geckos. Let me tell you, my, my eyes were hurting when I got home. But, um, but, but, but I just look at this. I mean, it's the whole village experience. You've got the kids playing. You've got the women washing. You've got bathing. You've got, this is the boat that we, we traveled in. And, and this is what's special to me about expedition, is um, these cultural experiences. Because the animals, you know, I've, I've shot the same animal in New Caledonia, and I've shot them in my garage. And which one's in the cover of the magazine? The one that's in my garage, because it's got perfect lighting. It's got a beautiful background. And so, I mean, I love expedition work, but I also like the control of being able to work in a studio. And this is my biggest pet peeve about expedition work. It's the, I mentioned this before, this is the photo frenzy. We're uh, in Guatemala, this is the Mexican, uh, the uh, Guatemalan beaded lizard. Um, this is with the International Reptile Conservation Foundation. We just acquired land for the, uh, the release of these animals. We have a, there's a breeding facility and then we release them into the wild. And 
you know, I'm there to be the photographer. And these guys all have their phone and their Instamatics. I mean, she's, she's a photographer. And he's like the most important person here. He's head of science uh, in the program. And he's like, what are these people doing? But, but anyway, I, I'm a control freak, if you can't tell by my, the nature of my photographs. And, uh, and this draws me absolutely bonkers. So when I do go on expedition, I tend to um, travel with uh, biologists. I work with conservation organizations so I can get deep into the, into the heart of the experience of these animals. I mentioned tarantulas. There's one small turn um, off one of the hallways that has spiders and um, some insects. And um, this is another, I, I just, I find these also amazingly beautiful animals and underappreciated. Um, and, and so there are a couple of pictures of these. And um, this was also a uh, iterative development to be able to capture uh, these animals uh, with this type of clarity. Um, and once again, just like feathers, um, depending on the angle of light, the colors, um, come and go, and um, you can, you know, with the rear lighting, you get each one of their hairs um, highlighted and uh, isolated, and it's, it's, they're stunning. If you can get past, what's that? It's the, it's the front and the back. So here's the eight eyes somewhere over here. Like I said, it's not really important. But, but I love the underside. The underside has all the color, and it's got the fangs, and um, you, you can't really see it here because it's being, um, but there's an, if, you, if you think this is interesting, you'll find it in the hallway. It's, it's, they're beautiful animals. There's a lot of uh, potential working with them. And then um, it was mentioned that I'm doing some work with the Junior Museum and Zoo. And it's, you know, for its size, it's actually a very good facility. And uh, the, I'm working with them on bees. And bees are really making the news right now because of all the, the hive collapse and the fact that if they go, we go. Um, and they've got this great exhibit where indoors they've got a live hive and you've got visibility into it. They have a bell drawer on top and then underneath it is an acrylic box, probably two by two. Um, where you can look into the hive. But the problem is there's so much going on inside that hive, it's really hard for people to understand the story. So, so we've been uh, shooting, uh, and here's the way, the, the, it's a live hive, so there's actually like a pipe that uh, connects the hive that's inside to the outside, so the bees come and go, and you can see these guys are returning with the pollen. Um, but, but it's a fascinating world inside this hive. I mean, this is the queen bee, and she's laying her larva into the cells. And here's the, the, you know, the bees emerging from the cell. And I've got a whole series of what life's like inside of these uh, hives. And, and it'll supplement, so you can look at the hive and see that live bees, but then there'll be a slideshow that goes uh, surrounding the exhibit that will, will open up, the, open up the, uh, the hive to the people. But just like feathers to birds and abstracts to the reptiles, I, I've fallen in love with the honeycomb for the bees, and it's absolutely what you could do with these things with light. I mean, this is front lighting, front and back lighting, back lighting, a little bit of damage, you know, part of the hive. I mean, it's just a subject that, you know, I, I get engrossed in these, in these areas. And once again, I, I tell people, this is the best thing, you gotta work with honeycomb. Um, and, and that's it. So these are all the parts of the exhibit you'll be able to see at the, uh, at the reception tonight. And uh, I think now we're gonna open it up to questions. Questions. And we'll have like 10 minutes of questions, and then if there are real questions, you can talk to them at the reception. How did you get the vipers to uh, pose? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, How do you get the vipers to pose? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm working, I didn't mention this, but some of these animals will really hurt you, right? I mean, um, uh, really hurt you. I mean, it's, uh, and so I work with handlers, right? And the good thing about these vipers is they're arboreal, and so there's a whole, um, so the ethereal species is arboreal. All the arboreals tend to latch on to a branch. And if you, um, in a defensive posture, is them just keeling back onto themselves and into a coil. So those snakes are easy to work with. I mean, I love the arboreals. I think that they're gorgeous um, and, and very manageable. The elapids, the cobras, the mambas, I mean, those are the ones where I really am dependent on the quality of the handler to control. And, uh, yeah, and I, I could do a whole story of, um, you know, I've worked with cowboys and I've worked with real professionals. And the cowboys, I just shut it down right away because I just, I, you've seen these pictures of uh, people that are bitten by these animals and it's just absolutely changes your life. And uh, so the arboreals are easy and they happen to be beautiful. So. 
Yes. I just have a comment. Obviously, in your illustrious career, you have also had to adapt, as the animals have had to adapt, in order to be able to get these phenomenal pictures. Yeah. Just a comment. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, for Michelle, what kind of challenges has pandemonium faced over the years? Well, we have a current challenge, which is we need more land. We've kind of filled out our facility, and we're in a residential area, so it'd be nice if we had more land. And it'd always be nice if we had an endowment. <laughs> um, aside from that, um, we face the fact that the breeders are dying, and so there are fewer and fewer birds for us to acquire. And so it's kind of a race against time right now. Thank you. How many um, of the Victoria crowned pigeons will you need to be able to in introduce them back into the wild? Our goal is in 20 years to have a 100 breeding pair. Ah. How many do you have now? We have 18 ah. breeding pairs. Uh -huh. How many did you start with? One pair. Oh, okay. We have one fertile egg right now, too. In the incubator. <laughs> okay. Just a follow-up question. Is that enough of a doomsday to perpetuate the species? Um, it's not ideal, but um, species like the Puerto Rican Amazon came back from seven. The California condor came back from about 12. So we're actually ahead of the curve if you look at some of the success stories in conservation. How are you going to then protect them? How are you going to protect uh, these animals that have been uh, obviously made extinct in those countries where they are at? How are you going to bring them back and make sure that they're going to survive the next time around? Yeah, that's a really good question. And one of the challenges in New Guinea is that there are no land rights, so you can't protect land right now. Um, we've been in conversations with the Nature Conservancy, and they're trying to get that changed. But the idea would be that there would be protected land, which wouldn't be, we wouldn't have any hunting on it, and they would be safe there. It's one of the reasons we have a 20-year project instead of a three-year project or a five-year project. It's not going to happen in the immediate future. So one of the aspects of your, uh, 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 so one of your aspects of, uh, you already alluded to, to return animals, you, the habitat has to be protected. Absolutely. And that's actually a political issue. It's, so do your educational efforts, you obviously the general public, do you also have advocacy or educational efforts around elected officials and leaders and uh, governmental agencies. Um, so, how do you how do you go about the ultimate goal of preserving or bringing back habitat so these animals do have a place to live? Yeah, um, that's absolutely critical. But we're not in a position to do that. There are other organizations, conservation organizations, that are trying to um, to have that take place. And the, certainly, your work enhances that because you're showing you're, you're preserving. Uh, the key to species preservation is the cooperation between a lot of different groups, each of which handle a different aspect of it. And habitat protection is one of the most important, but so is saving the gene pool. Yeah. And, and education of the locals. I mean, there's, there's a million aspects of this, and that's why yeah. it's, a, it's a partnership with a number of organizations yeah. to be successful. Yeah. yeah, we've done outreach to New Guinea, and in fact, we've helped raise some <coughs> birds long distance from New Guinea with conservation groups there. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is amassing the information that's needed in order to successfully raise and hatch these birds. Yeah, thank you. I've got it over here. Um, Michael. Yes. Yeah, what uh, color temperature do you typically use in your studio to take these photographs? You know, I, uh, I, I'm not sure. It's 6,800, I think, is the number. I, it's, I, I work with both hot, I work with actually three different types of lights. Um, when I'm working with the feathers, I've got uh, two different series of always-on lights that, um, that I can actually see what's happening. But um, the, the color temperature, um, I, it's as close to natural light as, as I can replicate. Uh, yeah. Yes? Question for Michael. Uh, why not flowers, kittens, puppies? Yeah, I just don't. <laughs> well, OK. Speak to other cat people. Yeah. Or dog people. <laughs> Uh oh, now I'm on record. <laughs> <coughs> Good evening, thank you. Um, there are cat people and dog people. Can you characterize 
uh, bird people and reptile people and trash. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the uh, nice. they're completely different. Um, <laughs> their insides are the same, but they're the exteriors. Are. The, the, reptile, the best description of reptile people I heard is that they have a high T to T ratio, high tattoo to tooth, and. Uh, <laughs> And that's not always true, but it's, it's, there's a generalization there that, that sort of works. Um, and I've worked um, lots of different, uh, you know, like pet, uh, you know, with the International Reptile Conservation Foundation. I used to travel to lots of different pet shows, and, and I was always entertained at the reptile shows. And I'd go to the general shows, and I was bored as can be. I mean, it's, so, um, but, but they're both passionate. They absolutely are committed to their animals, um, both people. Um, it's... Uh, you can obviously, in a, in a group of people, I could pick out the reptile people, but I can't pick out the bird people, usually. And that's not always true, because I know that you two are very uh, into reptiles. But, uh, yeah. uh, uh, I, I <laughs> um, do you want to? Well, yeah. well, we actually have a joint book coming out. Right. So it's a book about pandemonium, and it will have about 30 of Michael's photographs in it, yeah. including the cover. So, so we're excited about that. Yeah. A year from October. Yeah. You could pre-order at the table. Up. No, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. How did you guys meet? Should I tell the story to you? I'll start it. You can finish it. She wanted to well, start it. I mean, I um, well, I work for the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, and uh, I know that there are a couple of people here from that, and I, I judged the photo contest for them. And um, one of the pictures that came across my. Um, my, the judging platform was a picture of a Victoria crown pigeon. And I absolutely said, I need to shoot this bird. This is one of the most attractive birds in the world. And, and I sort of just pigeonholed that and forgot about it for a year or so. And then I'm looking at uh, the Palo Alto Weekly one day, and um, all of a sudden there's this story about pandemonium and a picture of a Victoria crown pigeon and Michelle, and I realized that she lives literally 10 minutes away from me. And so I reach out to Michelle and say, Michelle, I'd love, you know, I work with conservation organizations. I'd be glad to come over for a day, you know, <laughs> take some pictures that you could use for your website. And um, So we don't normally allow photographers on site. So I initially was going to say no, but we were having a big um, event, a fundraiser event. I had two photographers lined up, including one whose name was Vincente Corona. And it was called the Victoria Crown Affair. So I thought that was auspicious. It was a great name. <coughs> and two days before the event, he had to go back to Spain. So we were down a photographer. And I got Michael's call. And while I'm talking to him on the phone, I, I Google him, and I see his beautiful reptiles. So I said, sure, come on over. Well, he didn't realize that. Well, I guess what your plans were to just, just do. I, I wouldn't. I Whenever I work at a facility, it's a two-day experience usually. It's one day to sort out the environment, sort of see what they've got, get some grab shots, figure out what equipment I need. The second day, come back with the backdrops, the lights, whatever it is that I want. But I figured two days max. <laughs> and all I needed to do was a 30-minute walk around, right? So he arrived, and 10 hours later, he was still there. <laughs> and <laughs> he was a there the next day. Shoot, right? it's a, it's a... And what he didn't tell me was that the week before, he had gotten a very bad case of poison oak. So throughout this whole shooting, he yeah. had his terrible poison oak, but didn't scratch very much. Yeah. And that was about a year and a half ago, and Michael's never left. Yeah. So it's been a great partnership. In, in a previous life, I was a high-tech consultant and um, 25 years in technology and in business process. And, and, when I, and I worked with Michelle. Um, the entree was photography, but I, I helped her with back office processes and strategy and, and other aspects. So I'm, when we say a year and a half, we're, we're working on lots of different angles on yeah, this. Yeah, primarily with a lot of with our board of directors. Michael's been great. And strategy. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, it's 6 o'clock. We should go, go up to the reception. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.